So in the previous video, we talked a bit more high level about what a hardware wallet is, but now it's time to have a look at the actual device. So this is the Ledger Nano S. I have to say a pretty cool looking device. On one side it has the Ledger logo and on the back side it says Vires in Numeris, which is fancy language for strength in numbers. So let's hit the subscribe button to get that number up. Just kidding. So from the outside, the ledger has two buttons to enter the pin and change settings and so forth. A screen to display different kinds of information and menus and a USB port to connect your device to your computer so you can actually do cryptocurrency transactions. Here I was just testing it out, setting a secure pin and let it generate a private key and I'm writing down my mnemonic backup phrase. So yeah, it seems to work. On your computer, you will actually have a software running that interacts with the Ledger. The Ledger Manager is actually a Chrome app. So before I was updating the Ledger Nano, I actually made sure to open the Chrome developer tools to observe requests the software maybe makes to the internet. Mostly I was interested in if the firmware is downloaded and if we can grab the firmware update through that. So I left that open when I did the update. Now, don't get excited and think, oh gosh, a Chrome app and you can debug it so easily, how awful. It's not. This hardware wallet is supposed to protect you against malware on your PC, so the software running there should not really matter. Also, I don't consider further obfuscation really helpful, especially because I want to actually understand what the device I bought does, rather than spending countless hours defeating obfuscation. So I'm a big fan of that choice. Anyway. We are much more interested in the hardware for now and we will come back to the Chrome app later. I just wanted to mention it because timeline wise, this is what I did before I opened up the ledger. Okay, we can remove the metal case very easily, but to open the plastic case, we need some tools. Ugh, kinda hurts to just having spent around $100 and only a few hours later I try to pry it open and hoping not to break it. So opening up is easy, there are just a few hooks in place and maybe you could snap one off accidentally but in general it seems pretty straightforward. So here you can see the USB socket, some chips and a flat cable wrapping around to the other side, that's the display connector. Also don't get annoyed when I just show different shots of it, I just spent around $1500 on a camera and lenses just because I was so excited for this opportunity to make these videos that I wanted to have great shots. And I have no clue what I'm doing, but I think it looks good. So appreciate them. Anyway, we can simply push out the PCB and screen. It's not glued in or anything. So here you can see the flat cable bending around to the screen. And here are two buttons. Here it is from the bottom side. We can already see some very interesting looking points. These TP numbered points are probably test points. When you manufacture hardware, you often expose test points that are not necessarily outputs for debug interfaces or anything, they are usually just a way to verify that the assembled hardware works, so you can have an automatic device coming down with some needles and running some tests on it. Very normal. But there are also a few unlabeled points over here, and to those we will get soon. On the front side we have three chips, one with a lot of pins and then two smaller ones. But now you have to say bye to my beautiful shots for a while. Unfortunately, a lot of hardware research is done through documentations and manuals, so please excuse me for stretching this moment with no content and useless talking in order to show more footage from my $1500 camera setup. A PCB might look very intimidating and you feel like you have no clue what to do now. This is just dark magic, but there's always stuff you can do. Most chips, especially on typical small devices like this, are nothing special. They are bought from huge manufacturers and you can just look up what these chips are for. You don't need to understand how to build hardware with them in order to get an understanding of what does what. The most prominent and biggest chip here is this one. When you google the first cryptic number, the F042K66, you find a bit of information. I mean, the ledger is a known device using this chip, so many other people have documented that already, but let's assume these results weren't here, because it's a different device, then you would find some traces about STM32 F042K6, the last 6 is missing, so when you search for that, the results are a lot clearer. STM32 F042K6 is an ARM chip, 
And on the official information page of ST Microelectronics, you can also find the ST Microelectronics logo, the ST, and it's here on the chip. So yeah, pretty sure that's the chip, or at least from the same family. So it's very likely the documentation you find here is very relevant. This is just a typical microcontroller. Actually it's ARM, so it's a different architecture from the microcontroller we have seen before on this channel, that was AVR. Anyway, so this is an ARM 32-bit Cortex-M0 CPU, runs with up to 48 MHz, has 16 to 32 kilobytes of flash memory, so that's basically persistent memory where the program code is stored, and 6 kilobytes of SRAM, so RAM. So there's not much RAM on there. Other interesting features for us might be that it can speak USB. It has two serial connections, and we know serial, we have used serial several times before with the AVR stuff. And it supports the Serial Wire Debug Protocol, SWD. Hmm, stuff like that is obviously very interesting for research. But let's move on and have another look at the board. Do you see here those two lines going from the USB to the microcontroller? So it looks like USB is directly communicating with this ARM processor. And the one button here looks also to be directly connected to this chip. So this chip seems to be kind of to be the main component. It handles the USB communication, the button presses, and looks like these lines here are also connected to the display. So it seems like it also controls the display. Also now that we know the ST logo, we know the second chip here is from the same manufacturer. But when you try to search for those labels, you can't really find anything. Also is that NBO, NB0, N80, N80? As you know, I'm not super into electronics, so I can only speculate, and I assume this is a generic label because this is actually the secure element. On the Ledger Wallet website, it states that two chips are used, the STM32F042, which we already identified, and the ST31H320, secure. There's only one other chip here under the display cable, and that one is also from ST, and it's a ST8R00W, which is a synchronous Typo, typo, missing age, literally a garbage product. It's a boost converter with output current cutoff function. No idea what that is, but it's doing some electronics magic. Maybe it's required to drive the display. As you can see, it's just an analog component and not a digital microcontroller or so. So this means this one has to be the secure element, the ST31H320. This chip is designed for secure ID, so for secure identification and banking applications. So for example, this could be inside a smart card, like your typical banking chip card, and you can identify yourself to the bank. The ST31H platform products are serial access microcontrollers, which I think means it communicates via serial interface with other components that incorporate the most recent generation of ARM processors for embedded secure systems. Their secure core, SC000 trademark, 32-bit RISC core is built on the Cortex trademark M0 core with additional security features to help to protect against advanced forms of attacks. In hardware speech, a core is basically like a library in software. Chips are designed through their own design language, like programming languages, for example VHDL or Verilog, and we have used Verilog once before on this channel to implement something simple. So these design files or libraries basically can just be licensed by somebody and then they are allowed to go with that design to a manufacturer plant and they have then machines that produce chips that contain this design. And if you have heard of FPGAs before, they are like reprogrammable chips. So you can implement your own chip or license course for your FPGA and configure the FPGA with it. So ST licensed the secure core SC000 risk core which is based on the Cortex M0 core, basically a library based on another library, and they pay tons of money to be allowed to manufacture a chip with those. This means you can also look up some information on these cores, because companies might want to license these from ARM. And yeah, the Cortex M0 is a just a general very small ARM processor, small silicon area, so it doesn't take up much actual space on the chip. And the ARM Secure core processors are the most widely licensed 32-bit processors for smart cards worldwide. So I obviously don't know if any of the smart cards I have here use this chip, but totally might have one. But the explanation of anti-tampering features requires a secure core NDA, a non-disclosure agreement with ARM. 
So with anybody leaking this or researchers trying to reverse engineer it, the public won't know how exactly it's supposed to protect you. From hardware security classes at university, I also got a great tip. You should research a bit the pay TV hacking scene around smart cards. There are some nice documentaries and what kind of crazy and expensive attacks exist to get access to these secrets stored on these chips. But let's go back to the insecure STM32 for now and start by having a look into the official ledger documentation, which is really great and goes into a lot of detail. I want to highlight a sentence in chapter 10. There are two hardware chips, one being secure, the ST31 secure element, and the other having JTAG enabled and acting as a proxy, the STM32 MCU. JTAG. That sounds awesome. We will have a look at that next video.